Hi everyone and welcome. I hope you're all doing well on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. So while we just give everyone a chance to log in and sort everything out, please make use of the chat function and let us know who you are and where you're from. Okay, so we have Natasha from Centurion. Well, we have people from everywhere today. Hi, huh? Chris from Cape Town. Connor from Cape Town as well. Free State, PE. I'm also from the Eastern Cape. Okay, so it looks like we have quite a lot of people here so we can get started. So firstly, my name is Leah Bonham Begela. Um, I am one of the campus and community outreach directors uh, alongside my partner, Chris Palmer, and we are a part of the Golden Key International Honor Society, specifically the UCT chapter. So in celebration of Women's Month, uh, Golden Key in collaboration with the Uyinene Foundation, will be exploring what it means to take up space and navigate positions of power as an African woman. So before I introduce our guest speaker, I just have a few house rules. So please make use of the Q&A function to ask questions and then we'll deal with those after the presentation. And then if you just want to interact and engage with us, then make use of the chat function. So our guest speaker for today is Adal Moodley. Adal is the registrar at Rose University and an adjunct professor associated with the Rose Business School. Having been in higher education for almost 28 years, holding extensive academic positions, she has a broad understanding of the African higher education sector. Her expansive experience covers higher education, teaching and learning, research and publication, supervision and academic leadership. Her research interests have become keenly focused in two areas of governance and women in leadership in the sector. So I now hand over to Adal. Thank you, Leah Bona. Thank you so much to the UCT Golden um, Key Society as well as to the Uyinene Mkhochana Foundation for this opportunity um, to speak on the issue of taking up space, navigating positions of power fearlessly as a South African woman. Before I um, start my talk, I would like us to just observe a moment of silence. Um, we are at coming to the end of Women's Month and just to commemorate those who have lost their lives due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as to gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, firstly, can I acknowledge this year as the year of Umama Charlotte Matreke as declared by our South African government. This month has Women's Month in which we celebrate and we commemorate women. And I also wish to acknowledge gender as non-binary. I think that is very important that we do so. And I also wish to, uh, to dedicate this talk to the memory of women and children who have and who continue to suffer abuse and who have departed this world due to the scourge of gender-based violence. As you've heard indicated by Leah Bona, my area is on women in higher education leadership and the positions of power and influence in this field. And though I may touch on this a little bit this afternoon and maybe you'd like to, to talk more about that in the, in the chat or in the Q&A function, I also wish to acknowledge that you are, as the audience is a far younger audience that I normally speak to, that I'm accustomed to. So I had to reflect quite um, deeply on my message so that it is uh, meaningful to you. So I look forward to engagement on concluding my presentation and I'm certain I can learn 
so much from you just as you listen to my talk. I hope to have the opportunity to also um, hear your views, have an opportunity for a conversation, even though it might be very short, so that I that we share insights. And, and I, I, I think even though we may at times have different views, that is perfectly fine. Sometimes the generational gap also influences our worldviews and our experiences. So the topic of space and navigating spaces um, of power fearlessly as a South African woman. It's a complex topic. It, it's quite a deep topic. And when we delve into issues of power and spaces of power, what it means to be fearless, as we engage on this, we may find that there are various levels of spaces and there are degrees of fears that we need to consider. And once we are able to identify these spaces and fears, and we are able to address them, then we can speak of power and occupying spaces of power, but not only occupying spaces of power, but with power and in power. So for my topic today, I'd like to uh, focus on three areas. The one would be the space of self, um, fear and self-doubt, and then the area of power. And as we navigate this, I'd like to talk a little bit on self-leadership because I believe that in order for us to be able to navigate spaces of power, we need to look at ourselves first and we need to look on the issues of self-leadership. And then we can link self-leadership to occupying these spaces as I've um, identified. Of course, there are various spaces. Um, but for me, for today, I think it's important that we look at the space of self. And we try to un unpack this particular space. So what is, what is it, when I speak of space of self, what is the space of self to which I refer? So in the space of self, for me, space of self is my body, my psychological space, my spiritual space, and how I view myself. How confident am I in myself? And how does this reflect in the spaces that I navigate, whether it's spaces with my friends, with my family, my partner relationships, my work, my career, my academic space. And where is this, where does this power start? For me, power starts with building confidence in oneself. What does this mean? Many of us may have grown up in spaces within our homes, within, um, um, within a very traditional patriarchal society where our roles are set out for us even before we are born. So we are born into gendered roles, um, which are entrenched in our fabric of our societies, within our homes, within our schools, within our places of worship. And we learn these roles um, from a very young age. We internalize them to the extent that they influence our self-identity and our group identity regardless of what that group is and who and how we define that group. It can be family, it can be friends. So in internalizing this identity, we gain an, a sense of acceptance and recognition within the spaces that we occupy. And as social beings, this is very important to us. Acceptance and being recognized as part of a group is part of how we create meaning in our lives. At times we are brought up in environments that do not necessarily conform to a great extent to the stereotypical cultural norms of the spaces we occupy. But to a large degree, this is more the exception than the norm. So in living and in occupying these spaces, our sense of self and our sense of identity is very much entwined in acceptance within these spaces. Our confidence is derived from acceptance and to a large extent, it is through compliance with expected behaviors that we gain recognition within these spaces. But as we also know, as we engage in these spaces, we develop a sense of awareness. We come to realize that these spaces are gendered and favor a patriarchal tradition. Your space as identified has been decided for you. And as a woman, your space is not necessarily one of influence or power. 
we only have to look around our society within the various spaces. And I, as I said, I speak of higher education, where if we look at the statistics, only six out of 26 of our vice chancellors are currently women. And that's a very powerful space to, um, to occupy. It's a space of influence. It's a space of decision-making that influences the trajectory of our higher education sector and also has a very direct impact on our society. So as you try to assert your voice in these spaces, at times as a woman, you can be ostracized and it can be to the extent that you are brutally violated. So in order to speak about being fearless, we need to understand fear. What is fear? And how is fear introduced? And here I just briefly would like to touch on um, an article that was written by Sue de Groot in the Sunday Times recently. I also mentioned this article in my public lecture that I gave um, at Rhodes University um, a few weeks ago. And she writes up on a book publication by Pumla Dineo Gola. It's a recent book publication on female fear factory. And in this book, Gola looks at how fear is produced, how fearful women are mass manufactured. And the phrase female fear factory reflects, according to Gola, how patriarchy trains women and sexual minorities. All the people that patriarchy likes to brutalize, either because they are constructed as female or they trouble some other claim that patriarchy makes. And Gola goes further to state that patriarchy needs fear in order to have our compliance as women. And there is a way in which this fear is constantly produced. And once we are afraid, then we police ourselves. We do the work of patriarchy ourselves because patriarchy always dangles the carrot of safety, which is ever elusive. From the time that we are little girls, we are taught to be afraid of going out, of, to, out on our own, to constantly want protection, to know that we are not safe. So in her book, she tries to think about fear, about how fear is used in other forms of socializing women into femininity. It is, it is not just that girls are, are not encouraged, but they are actively discouraged from being adventurous, for example, where boys are actively encouraged and it is expected, girls are often discouraged, more often than not. And she argues that rather than fear, we need to tell stories of hope and possibility. And I think this is very powerful because we have been institutionalized to, to internalize fear. We need to unlearn this. How do we unlearn this? These types of engagements that we have today are, are part of that story, part of the narrative um, through role models, through changing the narrative and through doing so consciously. And this is a message that is not only meant for women, it's meant for all. And in, it takes tremendous courage to move out of the space we have to a large extent internalized. And sometimes we find that it's not something that we can do on our own. I think we can think about that in the various spaces when you wish to speak up, you wish to speak out on a particular area and you wish for your voice um, to be heard as a woman, you would wish your voice to be heard. Sometimes we need people to support us. We need people to affirm us, to give us that courage to move into spaces and to speak fearlessly. And in this regard, we need to look at people who affirm us and we need to learn to be discerning and to recognize who these people are. Who are the people who affirm you? Who are the people who support you? And in doing so, um, we need to recognize within ourselves that there are times that we are fearful and there are times that we are uncertain. We all experience that at different times. I know I experience that. Um, sometimes when I, when I need to view or to voice my opinion um, in a meeting, uh, especially if it is a meeting of the Senate, which is a powerful space, um, sometimes one tends to think twice as to how one would be viewed. 
And that is where we need to recognize a sense of fear and a sense of uncertainty because we all do experience such. And when we are able to recognize that and we're able to acknowledge that and grapple with it, and we say to ourselves, yes, I know that at this moment in time, I am uncertain because how I will be viewed or be perceived, I may not be liked, I may not be accepted, but I need to take control of my life, my decisions, my choices in a healthy way that builds me rather than so self-doubt. And when one can do that, to me, that is the moment of power. When you are able to have the ability to lead yourself and have confidence to do so without self-doubt, that in itself is power. And here again, I'd like to um, refer to Herbst, who wrote a paper on women and leadership. And in the paper, I think she put it quite beautifully when she says, women in comparison to men still underestimate themselves in spite of being perceived as equally effective leaders. This reveals the importance of emboldening women to back themselves more and doubt themselves less. There is no quick fix for building self-confidence or permanently eradicating self-doubt in women. So for me, it's very important. We need to learn to eradicate self-doubt if we are going to occupy spaces of power and influence and leadership. We need to learn to eradicate self-doubt in body, in mind, in spirit. And once we can reach a point of acknowledging our doubts and our fears, and we can embolden ourselves to back ourselves and doubt ourselves less, this is where the power lies in my view. It's only once we accept ourselves and, our, and lead ourselves that we can lead others. So let's focus a little bit on power. What is power? And to me, power is the ability to influence rather than be influenced. It is the, the ability to be discerning and to be confident in my discernment, the ability to make choices and the ability to say no with confidence. And I don't want to conflate confidence with arrogance and a sense of superiority. I've already stated it is a sense of self-belief and the ability and willingness to acknowledge fear and despite fear, to boldly use your own voice. It's only when we have power of self that we can occupy spaces of power and have a sense of influence. But there's also the concept of responsible use of power, power and integrity. There can be a danger in the, in, in the spaces, um, in the use of power in the spaces that we occupy. And we have seen this, it is a sad part of the political landscape in South Africa, unfortunately. In occupying positions of power, we need to ask ourselves, in whose interest do I occupy this space? Is it in my own interest or for the greater good? If your answer is the first, then then I would say be careful. Those who occupy spaces of power and influence in their own interest, in my view, do not deserve to occupy those spaces. We need to use our power with integrity and responsibly. There are always those who influence our thinking and decisions. And even though I said um, power is the ability to influence rather be, than be influenced, we must be aware there are those who can influence our thinking and our decisions. And here we must have the confidence to be able to be discerning, because if we choose to be influenced by people who sow self-doubt, we must be able to discern who is it that is supportive of me in my role, in what I do, and those who want to create self-doubt, because self-doubt in itself is what leads to fear, and fear is what patriarchy feeds on. So when we occupy spaces, whether it is whatever space we occupy, whether it is within a group, within a team, within um, a, a leadership role, 
we need to lead from a place of truth and principle. And I'm taking this from, um, a, though I'm not quoting it directly, I'm taking it from a sentiment that was expressed by the Vice Chancellor of UCT, Professor Pak King, in a, her address for Youth Leadership Week in July as a guest speaker of the Uyinenim for China Foundation. She said, you need to lead from a place of truth and principle. And I wish to end with a poem which I would like to share about one person's journey to, in my view, her power. It's a poem that is Before I by Insia Patanwala. So I'd like to end with that poem. Before I became strong, I knew what it was like to be weak, how difficult it is to love yourself, to find the wholeness that you seek. Before I knew the light, I have had my fair share of darkness too, where my world fell into hopelessness and I didn't know how to get through. For I have known the tears it takes, the courage to stand up again when you are broken down and bruised and you know nothing but the pain. You forget to appreciate love if you haven't seen the hate, till you forget the meaning of smile and laughter and your heart is left a bit. I have known the strength and courage it requires to get it right, to face the things that hold you down and hold your head up and fight. Before I was who I am now, I was someone I didn't want to be. I was lost, battered and defeated before I knew how to be me. Thank you. I think now we can move over to our comments or questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very powerful. Our first question is from, sorry, our first anonymous question. So it says, how do we change the perception that women can never support each other to succeed, especially when it's pushed by our male counterparts and has become a truth that we've come to accept? Thank you for the question. Yes, I think that is um, a very important question that we see um, that women do not, because of our sense of the lack of self-confidence and the lack of, of, of being able to be bold and courageous, that narrative continues. So for me, it is important that there are women as role models. And we need to see women in spaces of power and leadership. So it is a concern to see that there are fewer women than men in these spaces, because that's where the dominant narrative lies. When we see that the voices that come through are the voices of men, and we don't engage those men, you will see that the literature says that we need each other, we need, and, and again, I want to acknowledge gender as non-binary, but because of the topic of conversation sometimes, it's very difficult to go into, in, into those spaces um, as identified. So we speak in terms of binary terms of men and women. And because it's men's voices who are dominant and women do not occupy these roles, it's important that we are able to engage with those men. Um, and that is also part of, of how we change and influence our societies. When we are able to engage and be able to challenge, and that's where the boldness comes in, because once you start doing it, sometimes you are seen as trying to be like a man. You're trying to be um, what is seen as, in terms of gendered characteristic, uh, characteristics, typically male. So when a woman exp um, expresses a form of, of strong opinion or speaks in a manner that, that is not um, uh, associated with fem femininity, um, we find that women are ostracized. So I would suggest, and, 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 and this is what I try to do, is we need to engage on these with everyone, with people within power, um, within positions of power, because it's from those positions that you can influence the spaces and that you can influence perception. And it's not an easy overnight task. It's something that comes over time. But I, I do believe in engaging. That is how change comes about. I hope I've answered the question.
I don't know if there's any further um, questions. I, I'd just like to acknowledge the, um, the comments in the chat as well. Thank you for those. Um, I'm just going to step in. It's Natasha from Golden Key. To all the participants online today, if you have any questions for Adele, you can make use of the Q&A function uh, to ask your questions. As a woman, it is um, Adele's job today is to teach women and to empower women. So don't sit there silently. If you have questions, please ask them now. Um, you can make use of the Q&A function for that. Yeah, Bona, I see we have another question, so you can take over from here. Okay, so the next question is, I'm worried about how women in power sometimes seem to be the ones who have this desensitizing attitude that indirectly support patriarchy. How do you think this can be overcome? Thank you for the question. I would want us to be cautious that we don't generalize that because um, in my view, yes, as I said, we internalize what we've learned. We are socialized in a certain way. And sometimes it's difficult, even in occupying spaces of, of power and leadership, it's sometimes difficult because you are pressured, you are in the minority. And sometimes you take on those characteristics um, which perpetuate issues of, of patriarchy within our societies. So for me again, um, as women and as role models within these, we have to be very careful um, what the messages are that we send out. And we can acknowledge that there are times that um, because of the ways in which we have internalized what we have been taught, that it can come across um, in a manner that we perpetuate the status quo. And again, in those cases, I would say that conversations like these are, the, are, are ways in which we have to challenge and unlearn the types of behaviors that we have been taught. But in, this, in the same time, as I said before, we must be careful um, not to view women who have the confidence to speak out, women who have the confidence to, to challenge issues with, with, within those spaces, spaces, to see them as um, not not um, actually having the, the, the characteristics or traits that we expect of them. So sometimes one has to be discerning. Is the person actually perpetuating the status quo or in challenging the status quo, is the person being viewed as someone who, who is trying to be um, dominant, someone who is not showing the, the, the expected characteristics of femininity. So I do think it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a subtle situation. Um, we need to be very discerning in that regard. And we also need to um, continuously have the conversations. I, I think that's what it comes down to, having positive role models, having women speak up in these spaces, supporting women into these spaces, and, and, and looking at the changing views of what is leadership. Um, I think that comes into it as well. What do we expect of leadership? Is leadership what we've known? and um, in a form of a traditionally um, gendered view? Or do we accept that there are various notions of leadership and various ways in which the character, uh, characteristics of, of leadership um, can be shown? Thank you. I just wanna know if I can just please add a comment. You're welcome. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for the session. It's fantastic. Thus far, we are sincerely enjoying it. And I love the fact that you spoke about fear, because I think fear keeps many women from being the true leaders that they are. Um, I think, ladies, it's time for us, as you mentioned, Adele, that we take back our power, that we take back our place in society as leaders. And the only way to me personally for, for fear to subside is for us, as you mentioned, to break the silence. We have to make this issue known. We have to do it in the right way, but we have to create awareness. Otherwise, we are, we are going to delay the changes that are necessary in society for female leaders. Thank you. Thank you. I see um, quite a few questions yeah. in the chat. <laughs> we have some more um, <laughs> questions. So um, how do you balance between assertive and arrogance? 
um, I think I mentioned that one mustn't kind um, one mustn't conflate um, self confidence with a sense of arrogance. I think that comes from first of all a sense of self. If I am aware of myself and the manner in which I communicate to others, um, the way I I express myself can either be viewed as arrogance or as be, me being assertive. But I think to an extent, I do have um, a sense of, of control over that because the way in, in which I engage could, could, could actually reach out to my, to my audience um, in a manner that shows that I have, I have a voice, I, am, I bring a message without coming across as arrogance. Um, I think that is something, a balance of, of, of how we look at ourselves and, and how we conduct ourselves. But we must also acknowledge that even though I am being assertive, in some cases, it may be perceived as, as arrogance. And, and sometimes we just have to accept that, yes, as we go into these spaces, there will be persons who will view us in a certain way. And, and that's where the, the self-confidence comes in. We, we need to acknowledge that fear that we, we will be viewed in that way um, and ask ourselves, what, why am I doing this? Um, is it for the greater good or is it in my self-interest? I always ask myself that question. Why am I doing it? Because if you know um, what the reason is for what you are saying or how you're conducting yourself, I think that in itself can be your sense of courage. It's not easy. Um, there's a question about patriarchy in a male dominant career um, like law. And I think that goes in all areas that there are, there is male dominance, uh, male dominance in so many spheres of society. Um, and we need to bring men on board. We do need to engage men. We need to identify within our sector, who is it that we can engage with, who, can, who, who, who will stand by our side and speak out and, and just also be part of those voices. The more voices we can build, the more that is how we will make change or bring about change in our, in our various spaces that we occupy. We don't have to go out of our spaces to influence um, society. We can do so within our spaces, but it comes with a sense of self-confidence. We need, it would be lovely if all of us here, as we sit here, start reflecting about our sense of self, our sense of fear, our doubts, and be able to look out for people who can support us to a position or a, 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 a point where we can acknowledge our fears and acknowledge our self-doubt and say, yes, that is, that is true, but it is something that has been, that I have internalized because it's something that I've been taught and I need to unlearn that. So those are the conversations that we need to have within ourselves before we can actually go out there. Um, there's a question about how do I teach a girl child how to be their own in their own world? A very powerful question. It is about breaking those norms and those traditions that we get taught as children. It is about mothers and fathers um, uh, talking and, and how we engage with both the girl child and the boy child. So it starts with me and my perceptions and how I then teach my children. Um, so so there, there are those, and I think those are the conversations that are happening, and that is why we have this beautiful, diverse um, society. We, we must appreciate the freedom of speech that we have in our society. We are not ostracized as women within our society for speaking out. I think that's one thing we can acknowledge. We have a, a society in which we have gender-based uh, violence, but in our society, we are free to voice our opinions and, and that in itself is powerful and we must never stop to do so. It's the only way in which we can influence and change the fabric of our society. I'll pause there. Um, our next question is, as a young woman, what is the first step one can take to address humiliation, especially from someone, a man in a senior position? 
And then it says, especially a verbal abuse and intimidation that comes when a woman is taking up space and making a mark by showing excellence in her workspace. Yes, um, a very, something that is very real. Let's, let's acknowledge that it, it's something that's very real. And in, in, a, in your workspace, you have to look at um, what, where's the go-to? Where's the support systems? Is there anyone that you can, if it's a form of harassment, is there anyone that you can go to and report it to? Do you feel, do you feel confident within the persons uh, who hold office within your workspace that you can actually go to them and you can speak to them? And again, it also comes to, you will be surprised sometimes that if you have the courage to actually face a particular person and say, I do not accept the manner in which you treat me. I do not accept what you are saying and I will not accept it going forward. Please stop. Sometimes that in itself, just asserting yourself and having the confidence to do that can in itself stop that form of behavior, but it's not always the case. So you do need to look at what are your options in terms of your HR processes, um, do you have a counseling um, support center at work where you can go and share these with? And sometimes it's those networks, networks of men and women who support each other. Do not be silent. That's one thing. Do not internalize, do not let it cause self-doubt within yourself, but look at who, who is within your space, who can, you can turn to um, in order to, to challenge the status quo. By, by being silent, by being continuously um, humiliated, by being continuously, um, by continuously, continuously questioning yourself, you might be surprised that there are others, once you speak out, who also feel the same way, but you do need to look at who your support system is. Thank you. Our next question is, how do you go about building self-confidence and having a voice in boardroom spaces when language is a barrier? Thank you. So I think many questions, and I, I acknowledge the, the, question, the person who is asking the question. I think that um, in many spaces, if we know that language is a barrier, we need to speak possibly um, before we go into those spaces to the person who chairs the meetings within those spaces and possibly have an engagement because sometimes it's difficult to go into a space and speak openly in the space. And in, in bringing change, um, at times you need to go outside of these spaces and engage, as I said, there are various spaces, there's very various levels, and you may have to engage outside of that space so that by the time you get into the space, hopefully, that person or the policies within that particular um, institution will allow flexibility for um, expression in various, in, in, in various forms of communication. And, and, and the person who is sitting or uh, within that position, chairing a meeting or, or within a particular position of influence can assist in guiding how everyone's voice is heard within that space. Thank you. Um, in some industries, you still need a male sponsor in order to get your foot into the, in the door. Is that something that we have to live with for now until there's more females at the table who can open those doors? I'm not quite sure if um, I understand the question correctly, um, that in certain interests, you need a male sponsor. Maybe I don't understand what a male sponsor is. Um, so I wouldn't it may be the person would like to clarify before I actually attempt to answer. I might be answering in a manner that doesn't actually address the question. So may I ask just for a little bit more clarity, if, if you'd like, uh, please. And maybe while we take the next question, the person might want to type and say what they actually mean um, when they speak of a male sponsor to get a foot in the door. Okay, uh, so while we wait for um, him or her to do that, our next question is, how does one know when they are being a gatekeeper for patriarchy? Are there specific signs maybe? Is it possible that some of us are promoting patriarchy without being aware? Thank you. I, I think that's really an important question. Um, as, we, as I indicated, 
patriarchy is within our very fabric of society. So when we have certain um, behaviors that we find socially acceptable, and when we recognize that anyone acting outside of that, um, that is not acceptable. I think when we can recognize that, and when we can see that it is, a, it is perceived in a manner that if you challenge a particular status quo, or even if you behave in a certain manner, it is you are ostracized within a particular society, within a particular workplace, etc. Then, yes, those are some of the patterns of patriarchy. The way in which we speak and the way in which we are spoken to, etc. Those, if we can recognize that, and if we ourselves find that, yes, if I look at myself and I reflect within myself, how, what are my expectations of of the gendered roles within my in my society? Am I someone who ex have, has a certain level of expectation? And again, I would be careful to not to conflate having respect with a subordination. We have to be able to discern. Um, we need to reach a level of saying we, it does not mean that I, when I speak with assertiveness, that I am rude or I disrespect the humanity of the next person. It is all about our manner of engagement. And when we look at our roles and the expectations we have of others, then I think we can um, look with discernment to see whether we are gatekeepers of patriarchy and what we need to do when we speak to others and we engage um, and ask, when, when I'm in this situation, how do you find me? How do you perceive me? If we're open to that, I think sometimes we can see whether we are gatekeepers. Thank you. Okay, so we haven't received clarification about the prior question, but this next question is from the same person. And it reads, what are the things you think you need to change in academia in order to begin to change some of the mindsets that we've internalized? Thank you for the question. So in academia, what, what, what myself and a colleague of mine put forward in terms of um, changes in, in, in the gendered cultures of, of academia is, is a framework to support women. We call it the Mudli Tony framework but it's actually just the framework that has looked at the literature and seen that there are certain things that we need to put in place and be bold enough to have put in place for a change in academic spaces. So some of these is a change in policy where we look at how um, gender neutral our policies are rather than considering the role of women and the pathways of women, that women's pathways are not linear, that they are not chronological, um, such as the pathways of men. Women have many divergence, um, divergent pathways. And it is when we can consider that in our policy that we can start talking about um, change. We also need to look at how our spaces of, of power within academia, um, like our Senate, our council, our institutional forum. And that is something that I touched on in my public lecture last week, where I said, these are our spaces that we need to have more women's voices coming through. But women are reluctant at times to occupy these spaces because of the sense of fear, the sense of self-doubt. And, and it is only within supporting women into those spaces that we, we can disrupt the, the status quo. Thank you. Okay, so we received clarification from Nosipo about what a male sponsor is. So uh, sometimes you need a male advocate to speak up for you when certain positions arise. Okay, so um, so it's someone who, who, who paves the way for you. Yeah, I, I think it's, it comes down to the same point. Sometimes we, 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 we have to go into a form of collaboration or a form of partnership with those who support women. But I would want to hope that at some stage, male advocates will stand up and say, look, I am here. I am supporting this woman. Let's give her an opportunity to speak for herself. And in that way, um, hopefully, uh, we will have a change in the status quo. But I think men also have to be brave. Sometimes men are also ostracized by other men. And we need to recognize that when they come out in support of women or if they act in a way which is not in line with gendered norms. And, 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 and therefore it takes courage and confidence also on the part of men 
in order to support women. So it is an, an, a narrative that I would like to see and an, an, an engagement, not only of women ourselves, but an engagement that is inclusive of everyone um, who has a voice in the various spaces. I'm going to pause there. Our next question asks, asks, sorry, how do I disrupt the narrative in the religious space where there is no support system and sometimes even women seem to be resistant of women empowerment? Oh, I do want to acknowledge that our religious spaces, um, the, the, it, it can be a very difficult space because it, it's a space of, of, of um, there is a dominance of men in that particular space. It's not a space that I am, um, that I engage in uh, actively because obviously I, I don't hold any religious position um, in terms of those spaces. Um, I would, I, I just recall a story where I listened to, I had gone to a wedding and I listened to a pastor speak and the manner of his engagement from the pulpit when he was um, conducting the wedding ceremony was to, to use certain terminologies about women. Um, and the sad part of it was that the women who were sitting as part of the congregation actually supported what he was saying by affirming him. And I actually went to him afterwards and I engaged with him on a one-on-one -on -one and I said to him, you are a man of the cloth. And you have tremendous influence because our societies, our, our, our homes, we, uh, many of us come from homes that are religious and, and we've grown up in a sense of, 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 of a culture that incorporates religion and, and, and worship. And we really, um, we look up at our, 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 our religious leaders. And I said, that in itself is the tremendous power. So sometimes, it's a matter of engagement on a on 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 a on a on a personal individual space, but at other times it may be that we need to get. I, I know that in certain um, religions there are many women who are coming up as part of the uh, religious lead, religious leaders within particular churches, etc. So I would want to believe that just like we have forms of 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 bodies organizations where. Um, women come together, like the United Nations women's, Women in Leadership, those are some of the bodies or organizations that would need to be formed in order to address issues of um, uh, within the spaces of, of, of religious leaders and issues around patriarchy and perpetuating patriarchy. I think that that engagement is also important. Thank you. Our next question reads, would you say that people with an orthodox thinking ostracize or belittle feminists? I wouldn't quite know how to answer that question because I'm not quite sure um, what the person would define as orthodox thinking and why a person with orthodox thinking um, would necessarily be seen as ostracizing or belittling feminists. So I would have to ask for a little bit more clarity on that before I can actually engage with, with, with the question. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question while we wait for the person to let us know um, what they meant by that. And then uh, the question reads, in your opinion, do you think that the lack of females in the justice system as a whole affects how male perpetrators think that they can get away with things? For me, um, it's not just a lack of women in the justice system. It's a lack of women in every area of society where there's a lack of women's voices. And that in itself is what, um, um, that, that there's no, ch that is the reason why we see the continuation of gender-based violence within our society. So it is because women are not occupying spaces of influence and there are men do not see women as having the capacity and the competence to lead or to have voices um, that are seen as equal to the voices of men. It's everywhere within our society. So women, we do need to encourage each other to take up these spaces and to voice and influence, uh, uh, make our voices known and to influence these spaces. So it's just not just the one system. 
for me it's saying it's the voices that we have that need to be clear in all spaces of society. May I just add a comment there, Adele? Please. I just want to read what I wrote in the in the chat function. I can relate to this. You were speaking about the wedding and the pastor uh, that was addressing the attendees. And I can relate to what you were saying because as a woman pastor, it was very hard for me through the last 14 years to be taken seriously because of the fact that I'm a female. Um, and I just want to encourage the ladies. It is possible um, for you to break that silence that we were speaking about, to set aside the fear and to be pioneers in making spaces for women, even in religious circles. So thank you very much for your importation there. I really appreciated that. Thank you. Leopold, I think I see a clarity for, from the person who asked about orthodox thinking, ostracizing or belittling feminist. And um, the example there is traditional thinking will believe that women are inferior. I think that is the patriarchal system of our society where there is an expectation. And because we don't conform, we, we can expect that there will be a sense of ostracism um, from members who do not believe us to be behaving in the manner that it is expected. So we do have a sense of, of, of bullying within our society. Um, and unless we ourselves can form part of social networks and, and change that particular narrative, it is something that has come. It's not something that, you know, I, I looked within my public lecture, we looked at that women have only in the recent years, the past 150 years, um, been part of higher education. For over 800 years, men have had access to higher education. It is only in the last 150 years that women have had access to higher education. So these forms of, 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 of um, gender, uh, gendered spaces, these forms of practices of patriarchy has come through the centuries. And it's not something that just ends at a particular time, it's ongoing, it's continuous. And we will have to continue to form those networks and support systems and give women and men who support women the platforms so that we can influence the current and, and, and our future generations in terms of the manner in which we view um, women and, and, and space and the traditional norms that we have within our societies. Thank you. Okay, so we've come to the end of our session and in wrapping up, I'm just going to um, read one last question. So the question reads, what role does mental health in rural areas play in helping women to rise, taking, in helping women to rise and taking up of spaces? I don't know if it's just mental health in rural areas. I think it's general well-being within ourselves. So I wouldn't want to just um, focus specifically on on rural, rural areas, I would like to, to maybe look at mental health within yourself. And I, and, and I think that is what I tried to, um, to share today is, unless we are confident within ourselves, unless we can recognize and discern who within our lives build us, who supports us, it is very difficult to occupy spaces of leadership or to influence and, and, and to have power within those spaces. And that is the fabric of, 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 of patriarchy within our society. We come from spaces where many a time women are told, this is your role. Before you are born, you know what your role is. Uh, it's laid out for you. And you are um, socialized into that role. And should you, uh, and in some cases where you try and challenge that role, you face violence because of it and it influences your mental health um, to the extent that you doubt yourself, you are not able to function. And I think that is what we must recognize. It's a very sad part of the fabric of our society. So it plays a huge role. If you cannot be strong within yourself, if your mental well-being is not one that, is, that has built you, that you are confident within yourself, Indeed, we will always be the victims of, of patriarchy. And that is where we need that to, to look at 
who builds me? Where do I go for help? Um, who do I reach out to? And we need to, we need to have that little bit of courage to say, I cannot allow this to continue for my own well-being. And I need to start looking to people. Where can I go? To whom do I turn um, to support me? Thank you. Thank you so much, Adele, for this session and to everyone who's engaged and asked questions. I think uh, speaking personally as someone who is going into a male-dominated industry, it was very important and um, thought-provoking to listen to what everyone had to say, especially to what you had to say, and also encouraging and um, also the emphasis on being able to take up that space and be confident. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm taking it we are at the end of our of our of our speak of our talk. Yes, we are. Thank you everyone for joining All us. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Adele. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.